everybody. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us again for Dr. Jill Live. Just a little bit of housekeeping, um, and then I'll introduce our guest for today. Um, first of all, thank you all for your responses and donations and everything with the wildfires. It's been amazing to see the community respond, and we're, we've are we been able to give away some free air filters donated by different companies and products, and I just want to thank you all um, in the community and even just listeners all over the nation who've reached out to me and said, how can I help? It's just been really precious to feel the support of everybody out there. Um, second, if you want to find me, you can find me at jillcarnahan.com, all kinds of free blogs and resources there, um, 10 years of lots and lots of data and information on Lyme and chronic disease and environmental illness and now the wildfires I've been writing about. So that's all free there. And then my uh, product uh, website is drjillhealth.com. Once in a while, we mention a product and you can find anything um, there. And then finally, um, the YouTube channel has 90 plus interviews now and you can find all of these recorded there. You can also find all of the episodes um, audio on wherever you watch or listen to podcasts. So iTunes and Stitcher. Um, so today I have a guest I've had before and we had a great conversation and I know today will be no different. Um, Sharon Hausman is the chief medical officer and head of research for Intellix DNA. So we're going to be talking about some specific testing today that she's founded a company, but I, like I say, with products and services, I only uh, talk to people that I really believe in the product and service. And I'll talk a little bit about today of my experience using Intellix DNA, but it's a really profound uh, help for these chronic complex cases. And I just love Sharon for her desire to get the details out there and also to be research driven. So she and her team have developed a platform that makes genetics actionable for integrative and functional medicine. And again, I keep commenting on the bio, but I want to say what so often happens is patients or you guys might've brought in these, you know, 400 page reports to your doctor and you completely overwhelm them. <laughs> and we love the data, but it's not very actionable. And that's one thing I love about Intellix DNA is we have very very specific data-driven research-based things that we can do about it because there's no sense in having all the data if there's nothing you can do about it. And I know uh, Sharon, you'll agree. Um, this platform is being used across the U.S. and in Australia in particularly to improve outcomes in brain-related disorders. So we'll talk about a lot about that today, including memory loss and autism and mental health concerns. So especially in these tough, um, and that's been one of my experiences as well as some of these tough cases, OCD, anxiety, insomnia, um, depression, and then autism and the spectrum disorders. Recent publications focus on her work with reversal of cognitive decline. She co-authored a study done by Dale Bredesen and colleagues, as well as on improving outcomes in children with autism, which we'll talk about today too, and genomic-related environmentally acquired illness. So as you all know, I love to talk about mold and how it affects us, and we'll dive into that today too. She is board certified in family and integrative medicine, and she obtained both her master's degree and medical degree from Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Sharon. I'm so glad to have you here again. It's so great to be back. Thank you for having me again, Jill. You're so welcome. So let's talk just a little bit about just the basics on Intellix DNA. What is it? Um, I want to be clear, and then you can talk about this, but it, clear, it is a doctor ordered test. So if you're out there as a public you know, patient, you can ask your doctor to sign up and get this for you, but you can't order it yourself. So tell us a little bit about the background of the company and maybe even a little bit about your story and in getting into this field. Yes. So I, before I was a physician, I worked in research because I thought I was going to become a PhD. And I did a little, a lot of different kinds of research, but part of it was genetic research. Mm -hmm. So uh, long story short, I didn't like spending my whole life on one little pathway. So I became a physician and a family physician, which is kind of the opposite of a PhD yeah. in terms of we specialize <laughs> in people birth to death, nothing, nothing too broad. Um, but I always knew I'd go back to research. And after the 23andMe revolution, patients would come to me and say, can you use my DNA to help me figure out how not to get Alzheimer's or how not, I did a lot of brain science, mm -hmm. how not to get heart disease, how to help with my mood issues, all of that. And there was really no product out there really designed for physicians. So there were things that could say, oh, you might do better with a little bit more vitamin E or vitamin mm -hmm. A or B12, but nothing that said, how come I am pre pre having high blood sugar when no one in my family had it? How come I'm having memory losses? Um, because I don't have that APOE4 gene that people talk about. How come when I get exposed to mold, I have all this brain fog, but my husband can walk into the same building and have no problems. And then, uh, so we started to build this tool 
And then I also met a wonderful scientist from Australia who was doing similar kinds of work, trying to figure out how she could use people's DNA to untangle autism. Mm -hmm. um, her name's Dr. Heather Way. And so we then also joined forces and built our autism report. Um, and so we now are doing, we kind of call ourselves our specialty being the brain, but we're really the company that is driven by physicians needs and naturopaths and yeah. nurse practitioners and PAs, but clinicians to say, when I have this patient in front of me and they're a mystery, give me some clues as to how I can help them with, in terms of what things dietary, what things supplements, even medications at times might be beneficial to them. And what are the root causes causing one person to be so susceptible to these environmental factors um, and somebody else not being susceptible? Oh, I love that concise uh, description of what's going on, because again, as a clinician, first of all, you bring that knowledge of clinical experience, but also the kinds of questions that we have, like you come with this base of understanding, like, what do we need as clinicians? And number one, the complexity can be overwhelming. Like I love of all people, I get stacks like inches and inches thick of new patients. They're like, is this too much? I'm like, no, I love data. I love complexity. However, the genetics have been a consistent source of overwhelm because literally there's no way to go through in a visit a lot of times the way other reports and things are brought to us. So I love how you really distill the information into kind of how useful. And we'll talk in a second about what's the new things, but I know you have a new way of doing your platform, the, the you know next version, and it's even better than before as far as really bringing to light the key points. In my experience, um, I tend to attract the super complex chronic people who've been everywhere, done everything. And I love that. I love being a detective. But with that also brings very unique genetic polymorphisms that maybe they're one in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in a million. And because of that it's um, sometimes these pieces that I found through your test have been the game changers in the clinical outcomes, which means for the lay person, it means people get better when I know what to do. And it's very specific. For example, someone with very severe uh, fatigue and muscle weakness and OCD um, ended up having a thyroid conversion issue and another um, issue with dopamine metabolism that affected the um, predisposition towards brain disorder, you know, like mood disorders. And then another patient had um, an issue, her diet, she was trying a certain diet. And then we found out she was really, really susceptible to glucose as a trigger for inflammation. So we got her way off glucose, low carb, and it made all the difference. And those things, while they're fairly practical, you wouldn't have known without that data what to do in that case. And so when I got to a stuck point with these patients, I did your test and it really got me unstuck and the patient made massive changes. Yeah. And I think that that's the fun is because you have this patient and they come with these weird symptoms. And of course we do have these reports. So we'll have one report that we call brain optimization, mm -hmm. and that's geared at cognitive decline, whether it's from classic things like APOE4, but so, so much more, but classic things that contribute to Alzheimer's versus low oxygen to the brain, mm -hmm. brain ischemia versus environmental illness, like not being able to clear pollutants. Um, but we also have all the inflammatory, these inflammatory pathways, these detox pathways, these nutrigen pathways. And sometimes I'll have someone that's a mystery that has nothing to do with one of our topics of the report. I had a woman who came to me, she's a makeup artist. Mm -hmm. um, and so she is a makeup artist in the film industry. So she's doing you know, body makeup, face makeup, and she has her hand go into these huge spasms and then the brush will drop. So mm -hmm. this, you know, like literally the actor will have to catch her brush and you know, and she doesn't want to lose her job, but of course right. she also wants to be able to feel better. She gets her toes and hands curling up. And so I was trying the classic things like potassium and magnesium. Yeah. And then you mentioned our new report, our new report kind of sorts and kind of puts the mm -hmm. less common variants at the top. Mm -hmm. And at the top of her report, she was in the 1% of the population that could not recycle CoQ10 to its active form wow. or vitamin E. Mm. And so it was really, really interesting. So I was like, let's try one thing. Um, let's just try going high on CoQ10 and vitamin E this week. And literally within two days, those yeah. hand spasms were gone yeah. and those foot spasms. Ironically, she did call me that she got a stomach ache because the form of CoQ10 I gave her um, had a soy product in it. And she's oh. very allergic to soy, but we, we fixed that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's like, I got this stomach ache that felt like soy, but you know, that was easy. Yeah. But it was amazing because literally, you know, we had been trying to figure out these spasms for months. But then when we looked at that hotspot report, is what we call it, we were like, well, let's just address these. We haven't addressed this really. And then it was better in two days. And we get, not everybody, we get that quite an instantaneous response. 
but you usually with the hotspot report and the way that we now have it sorted mm -hmm. by addressing those five or 10 or 15 SNPs that are kind of highlighted as the most, most important because they're the less common, mm -hmm. we often get improvement in things we wouldn't expect. You know, you, you think about magnesium is related to relaxing muscles, but it's really important for mood. It's really important for attention and focus. Yeah. So if you're bad at making it, it makes a big difference. Oh, I love that. And like you said, so let's talk a little for the lay person who's listening. Um, first of all, um, the, the thing that you're testing is these differences in base pairs and how they express like a protein or an enzyme or something, right? So you're actually looking at the genetics and it might be the other thing I want to talk about is, so what is it that we're testing? And then the second thing is, um, you mentioned this one in, you know, a, a, a 0.1% chance, whatever. Why is it that those really unique mutations are the things that usually make a difference in the outcome? Do you want to talk just a little bit about those two yes. things? Yes. I'm just laughing because this afternoon, my co-founder and I were having lunch and she was saying, well, one question I think that people are going to ask is why it's not the common variants that yes. are more important. And brilliant. It's <laughs> a great, so you guys yeah. are good minds alike. And the idea, the way I think about it is everybody has these changes. So just to go back, they're mm -hmm. called SNPs. And I always say that SNPs sound like they should be a little piece of cloth, but they're, it stands for a single nucleotide or like a single little letter in your DNA, mm -hmm. polymorphism or variant or change. And when you make that change, it sometimes has very minimal effects on mm -hmm. function and sometimes has profound effects. So for example, that, that one I was talking about with recycling CoQ10, um, it's in the NQ01 pathway and two copies of it, which is only found again in, you know, like 1% of the population yeah. decreases your ability to recycle CoQ10 by 98%. Wow. That's a big deal. Massive. Right. So, and it's like the needle, the, what it is in my mind is you're telling me it's like the needle in the haystack. Right. And when I was describing my experience, it's like, what's the needle I'm missing. And I could be a brilliant clinician, but I can't find that needle. It just, it takes a long time with trial and error. And so the reason we look for these less common things is because they're going to help you solve those medical mysteries, because something that is found in 47% of the population it's not likely causing a problem that's unique. So if you look at yeah. our cardiac report, mm -hmm. there's a gene that promotes people to have hardening of the arteries, calcium buildup in their arteries. One copy of that gene, really common, 45% of the population. Two copies, 20 some percent of the population. But think of the prevalence of heart disease. Yeah. It is like 20% of the population. Right, right. So that's a more common gene. But when I talk to my doctors, and we do have doctors that deal with more common problems, heart disease, yeah. diabetes, thyroid, and they use our report because, you know, obesity, because it just helps optimize mm -hmm. health. But when I talk to the doctors that are dealing with mold, that are dealing with complex illness, those are the doctors that are taking care of the patients that were told they were crazy because mm -hmm. that doctor has goes, well, I've been in a moldy building and I'm fine. So why yes. should it be bothering you? You must just be oversensitive or you must just be kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. They don't say crazy, but they go, oh, you're really sensitive to things. Mm -hmm. you know, and then the patient leaves feeling it's their fault. Well, it's, it's true. They're really sensitive to things, but it's not because they're being emotional. It's because they're in that 1% or 2% yeah. of the population or 5% even that has gene variants. So a change in their DNA that they can't properly kick out those mold right. toxins, or they can't properly defend, for example, against Lyme disease when they're when they're first being exposed to it. And so they get a higher burden, which gives them a higher chance of having it persistence. So what we're learning is that as we understand the root causes, the things that make people different, we then can come up with targeted ways of helping them to kind of support themselves. And there's hundreds of options at any supplement store of what you can do, but this is kind of saying, okay, if I'm only going to use five things, what are going to be the five that help me the most? Mm, love that. And thank you so much for just making it so clear because I'm sure if you know, you're not a physician, you're like, what are you talking about? What I'm does this sorry, mean? <laughs> no, no, it's good. Cause again, we have a lot of clinicians who listen too, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they will enjoy this episode as well. Um, and like you said, this is a test that is ordered by your physician. Any physician can sign up. Is that correct? What kind of account, people do you? Yes. There's no cost for a physician to have an account. Um, mm -hmm. And it so that what the the thing that is what I would call the rate with medicine we talk about the rate limiting step. Yeah. I think the one thing that physicians need to know is none of us really got a good genomics education mm -hmm. in 
medical school or in your nurse practitioner training or even naturopathic training. So we encourage anyone to sign up, but know that in order to use it effectively, you do have to say, I'm going to dedicate a weekend to really learning this. And we do have a great training platform. We kind of call it Genomics University yeah. that um, we have that they can learn um, and get started. Um, and we will, for all your Dr. Jill listeners, be happy to uh, give them complimentary access to the learning platform when they order their first report. But it really is not worthwhile for a physician to sign up and go, I can just skip the learning platform. I don't have to do it. I'm really smart. I'm going to be able to do it. I have trained lots of super smart doctors and everybody finds that the learning platform really, really helps them to get the hang of it. So even though in our tool yeah. next to the gene function uh, and next to the gene variant, we say, this is how this gene works. Here's why it's clinically significant. Here are ways that you can have potential interventions. Having the Genomics University and kind of going through case studies and seeing how it fits in and see how to use the tool so you don't get overwhelmed and go, do I have to look at 600 things? Right, no, right. absolutely not. You really want to focus on the top six panels or the top six mm -hmm. things. But if we didn't have 600 things, we wouldn't work for most humans that are having problems that make them unique. We would only yeah. work for the person that's like, you know, has no problems. So I love that because you have the, and I'll just attest to that too, because we were just talking before this, like I've been wanting, I've been done a few of the courses I've, it's on my list of the whole thing was we had to get the, my book in and now I can have time to learn and do these things, but it has literally been on top of my list here and for a while of going through that I'm real in depth. I've done a few modules, but so I highly recommend that. And I, I love that. So again, if you're a patient listening and you're like, I'm really interested, you will have to ask your physician to order this or to get an account, but it's free. It's not going to cost right. you anything right. difficult. And we also, we realize, so one of the things we realize about genomics is it is so new that physicians like to do things well. I mean, why would we do something and kind of go, oh, well, I don't really know how to do this, but I'll do it. So we walk physicians, we kind of have a mentoring program that is also free where yeah. we walk you through your first three reports mm -hmm. so that you can get the same great success with your first patient as you do with your 30th. So there's nothing, nothing to be afraid of. I do some of the walkthroughs, my research staff help me with some of the others. And it's once you've done four or five, you're going to be really hooked because it's so much more fun to practice medicine when you are able to figure out what's going on than just to go, oh, well, maybe this will work. Even things like people who have high blood pressure that get labeled treatment resistant hypertension. It's not that there is yes. something wrong with them that's different. Right. It's that you're not addressing the root cause. I love that. And I, like I said, I can attest to that as well. You've been amazing at helping me walk through my first reports. And I felt like this massive aha, like, wow, this is really, really important information. And really now we're competing against machines, right? I mean, our society, technology, AI is going in that direction. So if you're a clinician listening, I'm just going to tell you something real important here. If you don't up your ante and your game and get to be doing the complex things, um, machines are going to replace us. I have no doubt. We already have all kinds of AI apps that are doing basic primary care, which is crazy to me, but it's true. So really, truly the complex, the level of stuff that we do, and, the, and this would give you a tool to be an expert in your field because you're going to have data and information um, that you may not you know, have access to with the routine CBC and CMP in our routine blood panels. Yeah. I always think of it that you know, with blood work, we can get it at you know, 10, 20, 30 data points. With genomics, you can get at so many hundreds or thousands of data points, um, tens of thousands eventually. We're still building the tool for so many other things. Yeah. And it's, I think it's also for me and most of the clinicians that I've talked to, so satisfying to take something that people say you can't treat. So yeah. we have a publication coming out, for example. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's publication um, done in three different offices of case studies with people with cognitive decline. Mm. All of the people in this publication happen to have APOE4. Uh. And so if you kind of go, oh, well, they have APOE4, there's nothing you can really do. Yeah. But by looking for the other underlying etiologies that these people had contributing, we were able, again, I say we, but yeah. I purposely was not one of the treating physicians. I, from a non-biased standpoint, when we do publications, I want the cases to be from other mm -hmm. doctor's offices, but the physicians were able to get huge gains in cognitive improvement. And they were all different reasons. Yeah. One person had problems with their nitric oxide pathways for, yes. for your patients who are listening or your lay people. Nitric oxide is what makes blood vessels open up from small to big. If your blood vessels are clamped down in your brain, 
then you're not going to get enough oxygen to the brain. Yeah. And so then things were done, including hyperbaric oxygen for this patient, and they got tremendous improvement in their cognition. And then, of course, also addressing other pathways. Another person had problems where he had too high of fibrinogen in his blood and too mm -hmm. thick of blood. Yes. And um, so he was the doctor was able to see that. He also had some other problems again and different pathways. I'm oversimplifying. Right. But so then they gave things like lumbrokinase, which is mm -hmm. something that kind of thins the blood and pycnogenol and addressed all these other issues that and the patient did much better. And the third patient had already been accepted into an Alzheimer's study because she had a positive amyloid PET scan. Mm -hmm. And so that was, she's an APOE 4-4. And she had a lot of problems with both gluten sensitivity that she did not know about yeah. and with detox issues. So we gave her things to help support her glutathione, which is kind of the glutathione is kind of the master paper towel of our brain. Yeah. It, it picks up all the toxins and helps you kind of get rid of them. Um, and we gave her things. We obviously in, taught her how to use a gluten-free diet, how to use, how to, yeah. how to eat in a gluten-free diet. Yeah. <laughs> and then again, we addressed other things. There were some vitamin pathways. And we can't change the fact that she's an APOE 4-4, but instead of having a score of 21 on her cognition score, mm -hmm. she has a score of 27. That's wow. really different. 21 is the borderline between Alzheimer's and, um, you know, and having a no mild cognitive impairment. 27 is the bottom of normal. So that's mm -hmm. a huge difference in terms of function. That's amazing. And I love how each of those had this one thing we would say, oh, they're all in one bucket, but they're really not. You separated them out and were able to do individual variations. Um, let's talk briefly about environmental illness, which is what a lot of my listeners deal with, whether it's, um, and I always say functional medicine um, can be basically simplified into infectious um, burden and toxic load. Now, of course, there's other little variations like inflammation driven by those, but at a core, most of the stuff we deal with is environmental toxins and then infectious burden. And I think now like with COVID, we're seeing more and more of this. Um, there's a lot of evidence now that post COVID, some of the long haul is related to viral reactivation and certain subsets of T cells that are um, impaired after COVID and maybe long-term. So there's all these kinds of things. Let's talk though, environmentally acquired illness. So it could be Lyme or mold or, or some of these things. Um, what are some of the things you see that might differentiate someone with mold related cognitive brain fog or depression or anxiety um, versus, you know, what are some of the variants you might see in these kinds of cases? Yeah, that's a great question, Jill. I think the way I like to think of it is I'll think of a couple of my mold patients mm -hmm. and how they were different. Uh, and yeah. so there's a lot of things that can contribute to brain fog and mold. And we kind of see this clinically. So with one person, they might have variants that make them have higher reactivity to their um, allergic system. So that mm -hmm. histamine, right? Yeah. There's yeah. certain vitamin D receptors that activate the mast cells. There's yeah. certain inflammatory interleukins, which is just mm -hmm. a word. Um, some of the, the, the different interleukins will go down different pathways, but one of the interleukin pathways triggers mast cell activation. Mm -hmm. um, and so the person who has more of that kind of mast cell. I had one patient, she had really heavy, heavy mast cell mm -hmm. and also a pathway that triggered microglial inflammation. And that uh, pathway is really rare. It's only about 2.2% to 0.5% uh, of the population. So for her, for that microglial um, inflammation and microglia for our uh, yeah. listeners that are going, what's a microglia? Um, a microglia are the garbage collectors of your brain. So they're kind of an immune cell um, that's supposed to kind of get rid of waste products in the brain but they can also trigger inflammation and they can also relate to chronic fatigue and your response to viruses. So microglia, you can address with things like green tea extract. You can address it with low dose naltrexone. You can address the um, mast cell type things with quercetin, with luteolin, um, obviously things like Singulair, but also quail egg protein, for example, has great uh, mast cell. And so the things that helped her were one category, and then um, in the same month, we had another woman who had bad mold issues in her family, but she was not that. Oh, so the first person who got more of the POTS picture, the kind of problems with yep. keeping her blood pressure and heart going fast and all of those symptoms, because that's what that cat, you know, that combination led to. The second person was the one who gets such brain fog and such fatigue so you know how some of the mold patients, they don't want to get out of bed. They can't do anything. They really it can mimic depression. Yeah. Um, and they just, 
They just feel like I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so the second person with that, her issues were more mitochondria. Yes. And my, when your mitochondria get kind of off, you're just kind of, you have no energy. That's your backup energy source. And then she also had some major detox issues, but there's a whole lot of different detox issues and hers related to what we call efflux transporters. Mm -hmm. So I will explain that. Okay. So efflux transporters are simply put the bouncers. So the bouncers in your brain are supposed to be able to recognize stuff that doesn't belong there and kick it out. So there are certain bouncer gene variants that help recognize some of those different mold toxins and say, get out of my brain, get out, go yeah. kick it back out of the blood brain barrier. She had two variants in her bouncer genes. Mm -hmm. And so she got that tired thing. So for her, things like K-Pax, which is a mitochondrial support vitamin, um, things there's a ATP mm -hmm. 360. You probably have other suggestions or ATP fuel that kind of mm -hmm. helped her build her mitochondria up. Things that help lots of CoQ10 um, yeah. for the detox pathways, lots of sulforaphane, mm -hmm. um, which is from three day old broccoli sprouts, but you can't just eat broccoli. Uh, so we, I think one cap is two pounds of broccoli. So if you take it, yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to get that amount every day. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we use what the, what Johns Hopkins version, yeah. you know, of that instead, uh, that what they used in the studies with autism. So I think that there's all these different things. And so you go to a mold website and you read, oh, EGCG can help you and sulforaphane can help you and clay can help you. And this can help you and magnesium can help you and mitochondrial supplements and CoQ10. Yeah. And you're like, well, what do I start with? So yeah. both those people are well, they were both some of my first patients. Um, and they're now supporting other colleagues and friends and uh, people when they get mold, but they're living their lives. And in fact, the woman who had the mast cell and the um, microglia, when I asked her if she could, if somebody who was really stressed over her new diagnosis of mold illness could talk to her, because she had to live in a trailer for over a oh, year while yeah. she was redoing her house. Right. She's go. Yeah, you know what? I almost forgot about those years. Right. <laughs> oh, like, I love it. That's amazing. Memory. Yeah, yeah. You can kind of like pass through and then I love that. And it makes so much sense. And in my personal experience, I have all kinds of weird genetic things. So there's some glutathione issues in that, but it really did help even for me because I was someone who didn't tolerate a lot of glutathione. I would oxidize it. So that was one thing that, that everybody says, you know, glutathione, but for me that it made it worse. Same with NAD, this powerhouse of a nutrient we love. For me, I crash and burn if I have a very narrow window. And so I can do a little, but I, I deplete methyl donors if I do too much and I crash. And so that's one thing. I have a platelet issue. So a lot of these inflammatory disorders make my blood thicker, kind of like your person with the fibrin. So then I'm more prone to clotting and that. And uh, I've noticed that at different times in those interventions. And then you mentioned nitric oxide and I'm on the other spectrum where I produce too much. I'm in like a 0.01% variant. So I've noticed I get really hypertensive, like blood pressure of 85 over nine, you know, like 85 or 55 when I get a mold exposure. So it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, exactly. Complete. Um, so let's talk a little bit about autism. A lot of patients and people, you know, have friends and family just that it's literally becoming, I think it's above 25% now in some, you know, areas. I don't know what the percentages are, but there's a very, very large percentage of diagnosed autism. What can you find there? What are some of the stories that you've seen? Well, I wouldn't have been willing to talk about autism until about <laughs> six months ago because we were still testing. And one of the things we do at Intellix DNA is when we build a panel and so we, so we, or we build a report, um, we kind of go, okay, this gene has been associated with autism. This gene has been associated with autism. We kind of put them all together. We figure out how the gene works, how you should be able to address it, but we don't actually release the panels or train physicians on it until a group of expert physicians in the topic have used the panel and say, yes, it's ready to go, it's working. So we are now really uh, feeling excited about the fact that our all of our alpha testers um, have said, this is helping tremendously. And we do have a publication and at the end, I'll be happy to show people where they can access that on our website with some of the initial cases that come out of Australia. But looking at some of those root causes, whether they be um, problems with how the brain hooks together, like the, that's called brain plasticity yeah. or problems with neurotransmitters, how you handle dopamine and norepinephrine and adrenaline or problems with nutrients, things like magnesium, folic mm -hmm. acid, yeah. um, things that make you predisposed to 
um, exposed to glutathione problems, mm -hmm. gut problems, all of those contribute to autism, mitochondria as well. And so um, what, there's some fun cases. There's one case of a young man who's given me permission uh, to talk about his case. And he is the first case in our publication that came out last year in the Journal of Personalized Medicine. And he is a young man who um, was diagnosed with autism profound at age two. Mm -hmm. And he was nonverbal. His mother worked with him extensively um, and then met, um, then became a nutritionist actually so that she could help her son. And she got some benefit by going like gluten-free, dairy-free, all of that. But on a score of like one to plus a hundred, um, having a low score, like a normal, a normal a neurotypical child of a score of less than 20, her son had a score of 114 when first tested on the ATEC. Wow. So she met Dr. Way in Australia, who was our initial alpha tester. They got his score to 71. It was yeah. still so much better. Yeah. And that was using getting rid of inflammation, mm -hmm. addressing gut issues, all yeah. of that. But then they got our genomics a few years later. They retested him. He was still at 71. And they were able to understand why he was having some brain plasticity issues. Mm -hmm. And one and that particular gene needed huge amounts of zinc and um, to help overcome it. Oxytocin helped overcome it, melatonin. So they, they addressed that. They addressed some mitochondrial issues that he had. They addressed other issues, um, particular kinds of inflammation, um, one that responded to sulforaphane. Yeah. And the, the long story short is a year later, this young man had his IQ go up 20 points. Wow. He was mainstreamed um, instead of being in a special school yeah. because of that. He was able to speak so much better because it wasn't that he really had that low of IQ. He was kind of locked in there because yeah. of some of the plasticity issues. Wow. And he got a job in a cafe. He mm -hmm. got a driver's license. Wow. He eventually saved up money and bought a car. And he is now um, actually helping his mother with her online platform and has taken some botany, you know, like pre-college yeah. courses in botany. So he was wetting his bed every night and now uh -huh. he's not. And that's an extreme case. Yeah. Um, but I just got an email from a, a patient that I have been helping. Um, and I have only had one visit so far with his son mm -hmm. that was already mainstream in school doing well. And the father said, you know, with the changes you've made, my son used to answer one word sentences like, yeah. okay. And he gave the example of, you know, they were, they saw Girl Scout cookies um, being for sale. And the father said, we'll, we'll get Girl Scout cookies another time. And instead of the son saying, uh, you know, no, or, you okay. know, yeah. why or something like that, he said, but why they're here right now. And yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in full sentences when he used to answer questions with one word and again that's with one visit and we added about five things we changed what he was doing and added about five things and so it's so um i'm really excited about that work i do have to warn uh you if you are a family member a parent that that work just finished its alpha testing which means we only have um we only have coverage in about 15 states in the united states right now we are training a whole new group of doctors in March. If you are a clinician and want to get trained, uh, we would love to train you, reach out to us um, so that you may, if you want to learn more about that, um, obviously you can go to our website and email information, but unless you're in one of the states that we have a doctor trained, there may be a slight wait, but you can nominate your doctor. And it's really- Yeah, and it's give me the website, right? Uh, for just for your, first of all, for your company, because people are asking, I want to put that in right now. So if you're listening, I'll put that in and you'll see it below if you're watching this recorded. And I do want to say that it's really important that IntelliX DNA is not meant to diagnose. Uh, so it's not meant to diagnose a disease. We're not looking at pathogenic variants. So there are some children with autism that or some people with Alzheimer's that have what's called a pathogenic variant. Um, and that's, we're not looking for that. What we're looking at is common variants. So things that we don't look actually at the one in a million variants. Yeah. We look at the things that are found in from about 0.5% of the population on up. And so those are considered common by geneticist mm -hmm. terms. They would not even show up in a whole genomic sequencing report because they're not pathogenic. They don't cause disease, but when you combine somebody who can't stop inflammation, 
yeah. or who makes too much brain inflammation with different insults, like you had mentioned environmental. So for example, there's some evidence that sometimes tick-borne illness can be a trigger for autism. Yes. Um, there's all kinds of fascinating research. That's not a common, you know, the common right. cause, but it, it definitely is out there. But we're looking at common variants, but looking at 20 or 30 common variants together could cause problems. And so that's more the child that they're born and they seem pretty neurotypical. Um, and then they regress. Those yeah. kids do really, really well with genomics. Or in some cases, some of the children um, that are born with autism, clearly many of them will still get significant improvements. They may not get quite neurotypical when you address their nutrients, their gut, their brain plasticity and, and brain chemicals. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. I love how you'd frame that because we still do this great functional medicine baseline. We do the diet, we do the lifestyle, we do the basic nutrients, but, and this has been my experience too. It's when we get to that point and maybe we should be doing it for everybody sooner, but it's always like you do the basics. And then this is the detailed work, like the, you know, uh, ex extracting the, you know, the details out of the needle in the haystack kind of example of where the real things that might really make a difference in this particular, like you said, personalized, um, approach. Yeah. So it's a clinic. That's why we call it a clinical decision support tool. It's purpose, okay. just like pharmacogenomics. A doctor might order a test to go, well, what medicines do you metabolize well and which ones we be more careful with? This is the same kind of principle. A physician orders it or a healthcare provider to say, let me better understand what might be part of the root mm -hmm. cause. And then the physician or clinician makes the decision, what makes most sense for my patient? Mm -hmm because we'll give yeah. a number of choices of things that might work on that pathway. And they go, oh, I think with this history and this going on, I'm going to try X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And what I love too, is there's definitely sometimes medications that are appropriate, but you also includes, include all kinds of research-based recommendations for nutrients and whether it's a vitamin or mineral, or whether it's a thing like broccoli extract or um, resveratrol or whatever we're doing. I think that's a really good point. I think that's one thing that differentiates us from other genomic tools, as well as other people's uh, kind of work in this space is because we're a clinical decision support tool, by definition, every single sentence in our report has to have a reference. Uh -huh. So if we say sulforaphane yeah. might be an intervention for the interleukin-1 beta gene in autism, we have to have evidence not only that that interleukin-1 beta gene variant uh -huh. has been associated with autism, but that sulforaphane has been shown to cross the blood brain barrier and help in outcomes in autism. So we don't put just anything in the report. Um, I have doctors all the time come and say, oh, you know, have you considered putting such and such in the report? We're always happy to add new interventions. I say, send me the reference yeah, showing yeah. where it helps yeah. and the mechanisms, and then we vet it and then we can add it. And then we have discussions of the interventions and the dosing in the studies so that physicians can know, is it is the study done um, in an adult or a child? What were the outcomes? A little bit more about what's going on. So sometimes I love the use autism, Go ahead. I would say sometimes in autism, the actual autism part of the study, they will have animal models, but then like, so, uh, but then they will have done human safety studies um, in adults, but they won't have biopsied the brain to see right. if it decreased the inflammation. You know, it's, it's frowned mm -hmm. upon to biopsy children's brains. Yes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> goodness. Oh, I was going to say that I mean, that's the thing that I feel like differentiates you and what you're doing from a lot of the other ones out there. And I won't name any names, but we were talking about that before where there's some recommendations, but it's all based on hypothesis and not really based in like clinical evidence. I think that's a slippery slope. It can be tricky, you know, to really. Yeah. And and again, because of my research background, because I thought I was going to become a PhD, those couple of years at Harvard doing my master's degree, um, I really understood uh, what we need to do of the clinical process mm -hmm. to prove to the scientific community that something makes sense. And I, my ultimate goal, of course, is that we do go through all the levels of clinical trials needed yeah. so that there's very, very clear evidence that this is a great approach for precision medicine. And we are at different levels of those kinds of studies um, with different um, with different topics. We're uh, actually just uh, supporting a study in autism that will be starting in uh, oh, March wonderful. on the East Coast. I don't wanna give too many uh, yeah. details about it yet, but it's not being done through IntelliX DNA. Um, it, it's being done through an organization that is in the autism world. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. And then, um, well, actually, and yeah, I have to get their permission to see who it is, but I will let you know, Jill, if you can do it because they're always looking okay. for people to help support their research. And then we can post that. I love and it. And then we're going to do a prospective study, um, some more prospective study work in the cognition field. And then we are working with some physicians to get more case studies and more publications in the mental health field as well, because during COVID depression and anxiety, those have been huge and being able to help people kind of untangle why they tend to get so much more anxious than somebody else has been really beneficial. Yeah, gosh, I think we were again briefly talking before we got on here. I think it's about 400% increase in uh, prescriptions for SSRIs during COVID. And that just shows you the state of, uh, I think, fatigue and stress and all these things that are contributing. And it's often, like you said, if there's a threshold where people are, life is pretty good, everything's going well, they may not hit that genetic uh, tipping point where they actually become depressed. But there's been so many stressors and so much going on isolation during COVID that I think a lot of people have hit that tipping point. And with testing, like what you do, you can find out well, where, what is causing that. Is it a nutrient? Is it a um, inflammation? Yes. And at the top of both the depression and the anxiety panels. So just, I keep referring mm -hmm. to these panels. Yeah. Our report is a collection of about 20 panels. Mm -hmm. All of our reports yeah. are going to have what I call functional medicine basics, things relating to nutrients, inflammation, mm -hmm. detox, gut, but then they'll have particular panels relating to the topic. So in our mental wellness panel, we're going to have depression and anxiety and OCD and addiction um, and, and those kinds of things. Um, pandas and pans is, you know, neurodevelopment. We have all kinds of topics, but in our depression and anxiety panel, um, the serotonin transporter, one of the serotonin transporters is at the top and it does make people have like 2.4 times or 140 times the risk of depression. And those people might respond really well to kind of pushing serotonin, but that's not everyone. And so, and even those people might also have problems where they have problems with certain amino acids or problems with cortisol. Right. Um, so I think that um, it's really helpful to kind of look for the underlying root causes, uh, particularly if somebody has started on a serotonin medicine and they're like, I'm not really fully well, yeah. or I'm not getting better at all, right. then you go, well, maybe it's not serotonin. That's your issue. There's a lot of things that contribute to depression. Yeah. I love that. And really at the core, this is just helping us do personalized medicine. So I love that um, because again, that's what most of us doing integrative, personalized and functional medicine want is to have that personalized approach. So Let's end with, first of all, where I put the website, your website in the links here, and we'll have it wherever you're watching or hearing this, you'll have a link um, to find the website. But let's talk about if you're a patient, what do you do? If you want this test, if you're a clinician, talk about those two groups and give people resources and how they can get connected. Can I share my screen? And then yes. I can just kind of show some things on the website. Yes, absolutely. One sec here, I'll get you. Okay, all set. Okay, so let me share here. And so I'll make it a little, so this is our IntelliX DNA website. And if you, uh, that's the homepage. If you are a clinician, click on the clinician and you can request a demo or request an account or ask your questions. If you're a patient, click on the patient one. That'll help you find a provider that's licensed in your state and give you more information. Um, if you just want to learn more, if you click on our podcast and video page, you'll see Dr. Jill from our last talk right up at the top. But there's some different podcasts and videos that you can watch. One, this is with Dr. Bredesen. This is with Dr. Perlmutter. I was Great. scheduled to do another one with Dr. Perlmutter, um, but uh, we have to delay it. It'll be soon. And cool. then if you are someone who wants to read more science, you can read some of the publications. Um, and so that's where I would recommend. Just hop on our, hop on our website and um, please do not call. We are a small team. It is much easier um, for us, if you don't mind, if you email or go through the website to reach out for information. And just for those listening who aren't in front of their computers, give the, uh, uh, spell out your website. Just give us the website for those listening. Intelli so it's www.intellxxdna.com. And the way to remember it is it's an intelligent approach to DNA. So Intel, I-N-T-E-L-L -L from intelligent two X's because the co-founders are two women and the two X chromosomes and then DNA. So 
Love it. Yeah, I love that you said that before because I didn't even know that. And I've known you in the company for a while. Sharon, um, as always, such a pleasure. Love what you're doing. Um, we'll have to update again in six months or a year because I'm sure there'll be new things coming out. Thank you for the work. Yeah, thanks for your work that you're doing in the world and for this great tool that we have. Thank you again for having me, Jill. It's always a pleasure.